Hey everybody, welcome to 3 Minute Thursdays. It's your source panel rights news and gossip all packed into a short, sweet three minutes on everyone's favorite day, a Thursday. I have great news for you that you're really going to be excited about. That news is that next week there will not be a 3 Minute Thursday. I know you're disappointed. I can see the tears and the crying and the protest, but it's, it's not happening. It's just not. Tomorrow I'm going to be heading to this like action protest camp thing for five days and I'm going to be back on Thursday so I'm not going to have time to make a video but check out my Instagram I'm sure there'll be updates and things going on there that will be uh, of interest to you we just wrapped up the Patreon vote I'm going to check out who won uh, as soon as this video is over we are going to be sending $1,733 to two different places so each place gets $1,733 pretty exciting uh, thanks to a matching donor. If you want to in on voting where that money goes to, it's two bucks, just a two buck donation to join Patreon for one month. Check it out for June. Oh, and I totally forgot that there are like a lot of you out there that are like, I want to subscribe to your channel, but I don't know how. And I, I just forgot to tell you, uh, you can hit that subscribe button, turn on the bell notification. Um, and of course you can follow along on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Clubhouse, um, and the Patreon, which I, which I already talked about. Wait. Okay, I think this is going to be a quick one. Is it going to be a quick one? Are there ever any quick ones? Do I even put the three-minute clock up at this point? And has everyone forgot that there actually was a three-minute clock that, that never worked really well? I don't know. Anyway, a few things that went on in the animal rights movement around the world, which I thought were worth noting. The Estonian parliament passed a bill yesterday to outlaw fur farming, which I think is pretty great. Estonia has become the 14th country in Europe to ban uh, fur farms, and they did it with 56 of their MPs voting in favor and only 19 voting against. I think a lot of different groups worked on this ban, but one in particular was Loomis, who I'm a big fan of. I've been over to Estonia a few times and did some talks. Uh, I got to speak at their Veg Fest a couple years ago, which I thought was really great, and I think they do really important work. They're a small kind of grassroots organization that are doing smart work, smart campaigning, a lot of vegan outreach, and utilizing all those different pieces together to succeed. And this is just one example of things that they've accomplished. In 2017, they successfully got wild animals to be banned from all circuses in the country. So they're doing interesting things, they're doing smart things, and to me, those things feel like wins. Nice job, Loomis. Speaking of fur, the last American retailer to sell fur is Neiman Marcus. But the question, of course, is for how much longer? This is a campaign that's only been going on, I think, for a couple of months. But the grassroots animal rights movement across the United States has jumped onto this campaign full force and are really hammering Neiman Marcus. We've seen activists in New Jersey, Los Angeles, Seattle, New York City, Dallas, Philadelphia, uh, San Antonio, all over the country in a variety of different places in a variety of different states, all just hammering them over and over again. But the thing I really like about this campaign is that it's very grassroots, it's very in your face, it's loud, it's aggressive, and it's smart. It's going after the retailer, but it's also going after those decision makers and trying to figure out ways to hit those places uh, as best they can to make them as, as, as uncomfortable as they can. So I often talk about the idea of like a short-term strategy versus a long-term strategy. And I'm not involved in organizing this campaign whatsoever, but from an outsider's perspective, they're really relying on this idea of like a short-term strategy. And there's upsides and there's downsides to it. The, the basic premise, in, in my opinion, of like a short-term strategy is like you pick your target, you figure out what you can do to move them, and you hit them as hard as you can over and over and over and over again until they shift. But it's short term because if it goes on for too long, uh, the consequences of that catch up to you. Not all the time, but sometimes. So the idea is to like win your campaign, to push your target to that point where, where you get them to do what you want them to do before they have the opportunity to kind of fight back. And you saw this play out in the breeder campaigns in England in the 1990s. Um, and you saw this play out in the Shaq campaign where, they, where the campaign got over 100 of the largest corporations in the world to drop support of this laboratory. But this is the critical piece is that when they have enough time to stop and, and reassess and defend themselves and it turns into a long-term strategy, that idea of like the constant barrage of protests and action and hits over and over and over again, they start to catch up with you. And so with the Shaq campaign, what was thought to be like a short one, maybe two year campaign started spreading into like a four five, six, seven year long campaign. And that type of like hit them fast, hit them hard activism doesn't have enough legs to sustain itself for, for, for that long. And eventually, yeah, it, it caught up to us. That being said, I think the Neiman Marcus campaign has the ability to run a short term strategy campaign and, and do it successfully and, and come out with a win. But on a personal note, having protested against Neiman Marcus in the 90s, 
I find it really exciting and refreshing to see this new urgency and this new uh, radicalism against places like Neiman Marcus. I think the current grassroots animal rights movement has really kind of picked up the torch and realized that like we can run with it and we can run with it successfully. And we're seeing that happen not just with uh, going after retailers, but going after fur bands, sale of fur, so forth and so on. And I think hopefully we'll start seeing a lot of this start to really pay off in bigger and bigger ways until finally the fur industry is history. Okay, did people hear about the JBS meat packing hack? I talked about people hacking the oil industry, I think a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if I put it on this or my Instagram, I can't remember. It's another good reminder to uh, you know follow the Instagram because there's stuff that's not always this, I don't know what I'm doing, you know, just. Anyways, this wasn't like animal rights activists related in any way whatsoever. It was basically like ransomware that they think were like Russian hackers. So they did it again with JBS Meatpacking, which is like the largest, I think, meatpacking corporation in the world. I've talked about them a lot over the last year or two. There's been campaigns, there's been COVID uh, issues around uh, worker conditions, so forth and so on. But what this hack did is that it shut down every US plant of JBS Meatpacking and it had a massive Massive disruption. Someone from the Steiner Consulting Group said, even one day of disruption will significantly impact the beef market and wholesale beef prices. So if that's your goal as an animal rights activist, like to impact the beef market and, and the wholesale beef prices, disrupting their distribution, which is what this hack did, can play a significant role in that. Prices for beef had kind of already been on the rise due to the pandemic, but now they could go even higher because this kind of this hack was kind of plopped on top of it. I can't talk about disrupting supply chains without bringing up uh, last week's uh, McDonald's protest size. I talked about on last week's episode, um, which I thought was really great. Today, I, I sat in on uh, Animal Rebellion's like breakdown of how they did it. Super impressive. I don't think it was recorded, unfortunately. So if you're on that call, I think you got some really great ideas um, about distribution and how to muddle that up, the tactics that went into it, the strategy behind it, the roles that people played, and um, what made that happen. If you weren't on the call, I would recommend trying to figure out um, someone you could talk to who was involved in it because I think it was great action. But the important piece there, I think, is that they didn't just stop at that disruption. So this last weekend, they said they were gonna use sit-ins to disrupt uh, McDonald's chains in London. So with a few Facebook and Instagram posts coupled with that momentum from last weekend, some of the McDonald's just closed down indoor dining altogether before the sit-in even happened. And the rest of the activists showed up at the other places, they did their sit-ins, and McDonald's responded again by shutting those places down. And all they were doing was eating vegan food in McDonald's outdoor seating areas. So again, like if nothing had come before that and they just went and did this action, it probably wouldn't have gone the same way. And because they have that momentum and that drive and that reputation, they can now start moving forward doing bigger and better things, and hopefully having bigger and better results. And the same can be said for that Neiman's campaign. Activists snowballing off the past successes like against Saks, Fifth Avenue, and the other fur outlets that they went after before that. It's building up the momentum over and over and over, getting bigger and bigger and bigger, broader and bigger tactics. And then, as I've said in the past, I think we start to see bigger and bigger victories. When we stop dismissing those smaller steps and, and realize that they are small steps, but they allow us to start taking bigger steps into the future, then I think we can start to see how we can move much bigger targets and we can see much bigger victories. But in order for that to happen, we of course have to keep fighting.